First and foremost, good afternoon, good evening, and congratulations on your admission to the University at Buffalo School of Law, and welcome to the fall 2022 entering class. For those of you who did not attend the Dean's welcome earlier this afternoon, my name is Lindsay Gladney. I'm the Vice Dean for Admissions, and I want to take a moment to thank each of you for joining us today and considering New York's public law school for your legal education. Throughout the week, you'll discover that we offer a welcoming and supportive environment. We've worked hard to redesign our on-campus events to give you the same high quality post-admission experience, but we also strongly encourage you to visit us in person. So by now you should have received an in invitation for an on-campus visit during which you'll be able to meet with a member of the admissions team, take a tour of the law library and attend a first year law lecture. Visits will be ongoing through the end of the month. Um, so we strongly encourage you to check your email and sign up for a visit um, as soon as possible. I will be going through eight slides during this session, which will leave us plenty of time for questions at the end. So I do ask that you hold your questions until the end. And this webinar is being recorded. So if you prefer to stay off camera, you can feel free to use the chat box to ask questions there. Otherwise, you can unmute and turn your camera on and ask questions that way at the end. If you haven't visited our Virtual Admitted Students Week webpage recently, I encourage you to do so. You'll be able to access our virtual tour of O'Brien Hall, including a look at the library and view a full listing of this week's live events. I understand some of you have difficult decisions to make in the coming weeks as you approach tuition deposit deadlines for law schools. So please take advantage of as many live sessions as possible. Um, speak to members of our community and ask lots of questions throughout the week. Okay, I'm gonna jump right in. I have a post admission timeline. So the purpose of this session is to let you know what happens after you're admitted. Um, between now and August 22nd, which is our first day of orientation, a lot will take place, um, but it is quite a while off. We're um, just under five months until orientation. So I wanted to go through a timeline of what's gonna happen between now and August 22nd. I will be visiting some websites during this presentation, um, but there's no need to take down any notes. A part of the timeline, um, Actually, the timeline is full of hyperlinks and it's accessible on our website under our accepted students page. Um, so there's no reason to, reason to take any notes. Um, all of this is avail available to you online. Okay, so I'm gonna get started. First, of course, again, you've been offered admission. Congratulations, congratulations. If you haven't already done so, you'll wanna file your FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid that is gonna make you eligible for federal student loans. Um, it may also make you eligible for some on-campus work study, although I'll be forthright, undergraduate students on campus are prioritized over graduate and professional students when it comes to work study. But first and foremost, and the, mo the most important thing about the FAFSA is that it's gonna make you eligible for those federal student loans. You will also wanna retrieve your person number and your UBIT name. And you should have received an email communication about how to do that by now. If you haven't, or if you believe that email may have been lost or maybe it went to your junk inbox, please contact the Office of Admissions and we'll point you in the right direction. And then you will want to um, activate your UBIT name. I'm just gonna open this link so you could see where you go to do that. On the university's website, there are very detailed instructions on how to activate your UBIT name, which is a username that you will use to log into a variety of campus services, including your UB mail and my UB. Um, so I strongly encourage you to do that as soon as possible if you haven't done so already. Okay, hey, moving on. Uh, you'll want to bookmark our virtual accepted, or I'm sorry, bookmark our accepted students page. There is a lot of very helpful information for accepted students. Everything that I'm going to cover in this session, you can also find on our accepted students page, as well as a link to everything happening this week during our virtual admitted students week. So I recommend bookmarking it. Um, you'll need to revisit 
our accepted students webpage over the next four months. If you do um, end up here at Buffalo, you'll be revisiting that link a lot to see what's going on when upcoming deadlines are taking place to learn about our Jumpstart program. Um, there's a lot going on at our website. You can connect with our student ambassadors from there as well. Okay, and next Friday, April 15th, is our tuition deposit deadline. So if you are looking to accept your seat in the incoming class, and if you're looking to accept any merit scholarship offer that may have been extended to you at the point of admission, you will need to submit that deposit by next Friday, April 15th. Um, again, you'll visit the Accepted Students webpage to find the link to pay that tuition deposit. Quickly, just going to bring that up so you can see everything that you have access to on the accepted students page. So this timeline that I'm going through now, a link to pay your tuition deposit, information about this week, our virtual admitted students week, our virtual tours, meeting ambassadors, learning about our Jumpstart program, which I'll talk about in a few minutes as well, information about how you can finance your education, and then housing options. Okay, moving on, if you are interested in living on campus, University Housing has a deadline, um, Campus Living, the department is called Campus Living, and they have a deadline for on-campus housing for new students, which is May 10th. So you need to fill out an application with Campus Living and pay an application fee if you're interested in living on campus. Um, there are apartments, um, available to graduate and professional students. Most of our law students who opt to live on campus live in Flint Village. I do have a slide that covers this a little bit later, um, so I won't spend too much time on that now. Just be reminded that that deadline is May 10th. Okay, on May 16th, you will be sent an email from the admissions office and um, linking you to something called the intent to enroll form. The intent to enroll form is in lieu of a second tuition deposit and is the final step to securing your seat in the entering class. It also authorizes the University at Buffalo School of Law to enroll you in fall courses. Um, there are a couple other things that you need to do um, to be able to enroll in courses as well, and I'll cover those in just a few moments. But the very first step after paying that tuition deposit is submitting the intent to enroll form. You cannot fill that out quite yet. Um, it will be sent again by email to everyone who's paid a tuition deposit on May 16th. And the deadline to submit the intent to enroll form will be June 1st. So you'll have about two weeks from the time the email goes out to confirm your enrollment. Um, by filling out the intent to enroll form. And again, this is in place of a second tuition deposit. We only require one tuition deposit in the amount of $400, and that is due on next Friday, April 15th. Okay, June and July. There's not a whole ton that goes on during June and July, other than your intent to enroll form being due on June 1st. Also, at some point in June, you will receive an email from the Office of Admissions inviting you to opt in to our extended orientation program called Jumpstart. Now, some students who are admitted are required to participate, and you'll know because it would have been outlined in your admit email that you received at the point of admission. If your email does not mention Jumpstart, um, you will still be invited to participate. And again, this is an extended orientation program the program for domestic students begins um, two weeks before orientation. I believe it's August 8th or 9th. Um, I don't have the, the Monday memorized, but it's two weeks before orientation begins. And if you're a international student, then we welcome you to participate in a three-week extended orientation program. In fact, you again, you might be required, so make sure you're referencing your admit letter. You will receive an email again during the month of June inviting you to participate and you will be able to opt in. We'll typically give you a few weeks to make that choice with a deadline at some point in July. And then something else you might wanna do during your summer, it's completely optional, is check out our recommended summer reading list. I'm gonna visit that website quickly. 
Um, this list was put together by School of Law, School of Law faculty and our law library staff. Um, again, it is completely optional, but if you're thinking that you might want to look into some of these options and see what our faculty are recommending and kind of just you're eager to get your legal education started, you are welcome to check out our recommended summer reading list. Um, and again, I can't overstate that it is not required. Um, it is completely optional. Moving on. July 15th is a key date. That is a date um, by which your final degree noted transcript is due. Um, and that transcript, for those of you who are still in the process of completing your baccalaureate degree, you won't want to request that until you know that your undergraduate degree has been conferred. For students who've been admitted and graduated in, you know, last year or a number of years ago, it's very possible that we already have your degree noted transcript on file from the Law School Admission Council. We will start sending reminder emails likely in, in June, just after that um, intent to enroll form deadline passes, um, reminding you if you don't already have it on file that we need that final transcript in by July 15th. Um, we cannot, um, our office, our records and registration office at the School of Law will not be able to enroll you in courses until we have that degree noted transcript in hand. Um, so that is an important date. Um, it's also a suggested deadline that we put out there for your required immunizations. Um, and again, that's something that we, you know, we won't be able to register you for courses unless those are on file with the university. Um, so three things need to happen before we can enroll you in courses. Four, actually. First, you need to submit a tuition deposit, which is due by next Friday, the 15th of April. The second thing is you must submit the intent to enroll form that is um, due on uh, June 1st. You must have your immunization requirements uh, fulfilled with the university. And then finally, you must have your baccalaureate degree noted transcript on file with the Law School Admission Council. Um, so another thing I want to say about your final transcript is that it must go through LSAC. We don't want you to send it to O'Brien Hall to the admissions office. It must be on file with the Law School Admission Council. Um, so just how you submitted transcripts when you applied for admission through your LSEC account, you're, you're going to do the same thing if, you're, um, if you have not yet graduated um, and your degree is pending. Okay, moving on. Um, a lot starts to happen in the, um, with August 1st. So fall course registration will happen. Our records and registration office, again, if you've met all the requirements and you do not have any holds on your account with the university, you will be enrolled in courses. Students are enrolled blindly. So you don't have any say, you don't have a choice. We have one of two different class sections. Um, I believe it's section U and section B. And then each section has a subsection for our legal analysis, writing and research course. Um, and that's a smaller course of about 25 students. Your law lectures will be a bit larger, upwards to 75 or 80 students. Um, again, we don't take any requests. Um, if we did that, we would be fielding requests from every incoming student. The schedule is not yet out, um, but you will be blindly enrolled in courses. Again, starting um, early August is typically when our records and registration office will begin registering you for courses. Once you are registered, you'll get an email from the admissions office letting you know you've been enrolled informing you how of how you can um, access your course schedule and, re and review your um, book requirements if they've been listed by the faculty members teaching your, in your section. Uh, so that's an important date. Um, there are some asterisks here. The timing is subject to change on some of these things. So fall course registration, which will generate your tuition bill, it's around August 1st. Again, it's gonna be dependent on how busy our records and registration office is, but that's typically the time of year when new students are enrolled in courses. There are a couple of things that will happen. Um, our legal analysis, writing and research instructors will begin to post class assignments in early August. Um, 
Again, you, you can't uh, access class assignments until you've been registered. So that's why it's very, very important that you get your transcript in, you meet the university's immunization requirements, and you fill out that intent to enroll form. And we will be sending communications and reminders. We will you know, certainly let you know if you're missing something. And you'll also begin to hear from classmates if you're on our Facebook group who've been enrolled in their sections. Um, and typically, if you have not been enrolled in your section, it's because you're missing something. And we strongly encourage you to check your email to make sure um, that you're not missing anything, or if you are, that you're working to, to, to make sure that it's taken care of. Once you are registered for courses, you will be able to complete the university's sexual assault prevention course, which is required. And you will also be able to um, um, you'll be able to get your UBID card as well as your parking permit. Um, so you cannot pursue those things until you've been registered for courses. Um, that's why I put the asterisk there because it does require course registration. Moving on. August 1st is also the date um, that Jumpstart begins for our foreign trained attorneys. We do have foreign trained attorneys um, enrolled in all of our degree programs. Um, so if you're one of them, you have already received a communication about Jumpstart. Um, and then for our domestic students, Jumpstart begins on Monday, August 8th. And Monday, August 8th is also the date around which we suggest starting to look into your required textbooks. Again, that will be something that um, the faculty member teaching your class will have to post themselves. Sometimes our some faculty members are a little bit slower than others. Um, so students get very anxious if their professors haven't posted the required textbooks. There's nothing that admissions can really do about that. We just strongly recommend that you reach out to your professors and ask them when they will um, plan to post the required textbooks. We don't recommend purchasing a textbook before you hear from the faculty member. Hopefully everyone will have their requirements up by August 8th, um, but if not, you will have access to um, professor email addresses and we you know, can certainly reach out and ask when they expect to have their textbooks um, listed. Okay, and then Monday, August 22nd is the first day of mandatory orientation. Um, I can't overstate that it is mandatory. Everyone must participate in orientation um, and they must participate in every day of orientation. And that is because your legal analysis writing and research course begins on the second day of orientation. So that will be Tuesday, August 23rd. You will actually be in class with your writing instructor. Um, who you will have class with throughout the entire year. Whoever you have in the fall will also be teaching you in legal analysis, writing and research too in the spring. So the writing program kicks off on your very second day of orientation. This class, which is why orientation is mandatory. Your legal analysis, writing and research course will also meet throughout the duration of orientation, which is that Monday through Friday at the end of August as well as the following week, Monday and Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, August 31st is when your doctrinal courses will begin. So your lecture courses. Um, and, that, and, and also when your legal analysis writing and research course will begin following that typical fall schedule. And also for anyone um, who doesn't know what GARP stands for, it's our General Academic Requirements, Policies and Code of Student Conduct. And we ask students to review that prior to orientation because you will be required to sign that during one of your orientation section sessions. And it is a fairly long document. Um, so we do want you to read that in advance. Just checking my notes to see if I missed anything before I move on um, to the next slide. Okay. So the next slide is, um, I wanted to highlight a webinar that we have um, posted to our video gallery that um, was done by our, the university's assistant director for financial aid, Christina Horner, and it is specific to law students. So it is a financial aid webinar. Um, if we strongly recommend if you have questions about um, federal student loans 
or how you can finance your legal education, certainly you can ask admissions, um, but Christina Horner, the Assistant Director for Financial Aid is far more versed in um, financial aid, so it would not hurt. Um, in fact, we, we strongly encourage you to listen to her webinar. Um, that will be very helpful for you in understanding you know, how to take out a federal student loan if you are interested in doing so and might answer some questions, some other questions as well that you haven't thought of yet. Um, again, admissions is happy to field those questions, but we would point you to the webinar to start. Um, if you were awarded a merit scholarship, please note that your scholarship will not appear on your financial aid award letter. Um, scholarships are awarded by the School of Law and not tied to information provided on your FAFSA. Um, so you will not see that on your award letter if you received one or if you will receive one um, in the coming weeks. It will most likely include just information regarding your federal loan options. Merit scholarship awards will, again, have no impact on your federal loan option Op, federal loan options, but they will impact your cost of attendance. Um, so cost of attendance and tuition are, are two very different things. Cost of attendance is going to um, tie in your, um, your housing expenses, transportation, books, um, meals, as well as your, your tuition and university fees. Um, so if you were awarded a merit scholarship, that will um, reduce your cost of attendance by the amount of your scholarship or any grant that you may have received. Again, I'm not going to go into too many details here. I'm happy to answer questions during the Q&A, but I strongly recommend um, watching Christina Horner's video so you have a better understanding about how financial aid works. Um, just keep in mind that your scholarship award won't be noted in your um, financial aid award letter. They will be posted to student accounts by around mid-July, and which is before your tuition bill generates. And so you won't see it posted on your student account. We do get a lot of questions about this. Um, and the reason why we don't post it sooner is because we have a lot of changes that happen over the summer with our incoming class. And once we post an award, if someone were to drop, we would have to go in and, and remove that award. So we do try to wait until after our intent to enroll form deadline and after we have your final transcripts in, um, but we do post those around mid-July. And again, that is before your tuition bill generates. Okay. As mentioned previously, um, I did want to talk briefly about housing options. Um, we do have on-campus housing options for graduate and professional students. Uh, the um, university's campus living department they do reserve spaces in Flint Village for law students. Um, so they do have law housing if you're interested um, and you wanna be among other law students who are living on campus, then we would recommend selecting Flint Village. There's also um, two bedroom townhomes in Creekside Village if you're interested in that or if you have a partner or family who needs to stay with you, that would be a great option um, instead of Flint Village, which offers one or two apartments um, for law students. I also wanted to mention that it is possible if we don't get enough interest in um, Flint Village from law students that you would be placed with other graduate students or even upper level undergraduate students. However, everyone in the on-campus apartments has their own bedroom and there are options to have your own bathroom if you selected that option as well. So there's just something to keep in mind if, if you're considering living on campus. It is a great option if you're coming from out of town, you're not too familiar with the area. Flint Village is a, about a five minute walk through a couple parking lots, so it's very convenient. Um, and then you would always have the option, of course, to move off campus once you are more familiar with campus and Western New York. And then um, for off-campus housing, if you know on-campus is, is not for you, there are tons of private apartments and homes available near the School of Law, as well as in the city of Buffalo and neighboring suburbs. They really run the gamut in terms of cost, um, but a great resource if, you, if you're if you not from Western New York is our Buffalo 101 video, which covers everything about Buffalo, including housing, um, food and restaurants, and transportation. And if you visit our video gallery on the admitted students page um, under our virtual admitted students week um, link, you'll have access to that video. So strongly recommend it again, 
even if you are from the area and need a refresher, but especially if, if you're not from Buffalo and you're not familiar with Western New York, it would be a great resource for you. Okay, and by now you've probably heard about our admitted student mentor program by email. Um, we also have an ambassador program and I just wanted to share the links to remind you that you have students um, as resources. If you haven't already reached out to your mentor and you have questions that you wanna ask a fellow student and maybe not someone from the admission staff um, to hear you know, a firsthand experience from a student, then we you know, strongly recommend taking advantage of your mentor. But you can also visit our ambassador page to learn about all of our ambassadors and what they're involved with at the law school, where they're from, um, what, um, what area of practice they're interested in, um, just to get a sense for, for our student community at the law school. Okay, so you can start to imagine yourself here. Um, we plan to enroll about 150 students into our three-year JD class, for, so for the class of 2025. Um, and I wanted to also mention, if you visit our website, you can link to, under the admissions leak, our most recent class profile. So the class that we enrolled in August of 2021, you can learn about all of their stats, um, you know, their undergraduate majors, what schools they came from, what type of positions they held prior to law school. Um, but we hope that you will make up our next incoming class and that we will see you in August for orientation, if not for our extended Jumpstart program. Okay, so at this point in time, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and open up the floor to questions. Hey, I see Nathan has a question. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks so much for, for hosting this. I, I just had a, um, a question on, I think, um, something that was brought up that you'd mentioned um, initially. Uh, on like uh, in-person campus tours, is that, I, I take it that that's not part of like the virtual uh, series week this week and that's like a separate separate event there? Yes, so we welcome admitted students to um, visit campus and take a tour. We actually paired up with our law library staff to offer library tours. Um, you know, as law students, you definitely wanna get to know the library and there've been a lot of updates recently made to the library. Um, but we actually just plan these campus tours once um, the university dropped the mask mandate um, in early March. And in January, you know, it was very unclear whether or not we, were, we would be able to host in-person events. Um, so in addition to having this virtual week, we wanted to give our admitted students the option to visit us in person. You can meet with an admission uh, a member of the admissions team. You can um, sit in on a law lecture. And then you can also take a tour of the law library. Um, those visits will begin on April 11th, Monday, April 11th, a week from today, and they will take place Monday through Thursday until the last Thursday in April, which is April 28th. We welcome you to visit in person after the end of April. It's just at, um, after that time, you won't be able to sit in on a law lecture because they will be preparing for final exams and our, our lectures will be over for the semester. Um, I believe Laurel Root, our Director of Recruitment and Admissions, just put the link in the chat box um, so you can schedule your in-person visit with class and a tour at the link in the chat box. Awesome, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, I see a question in the chat box. If we were accepted and deferred a year, do we have to resubmit a tuition deposit or undergraduate transcripts? No. So if you deferred from last year, and this is oftentimes the case for students pursuing our dual degree programs, they end up starting in the other program and defer their um, year one in law school. Nope, you do not need to resubmit your deposit. You also do not need to resubmit your transcript unless um, we find out that we don't have it on file, but I'm pretty sure we, we will have already have that on file you will need to um, submit the intent to enroll form. And again, that will go out on May 16th with the deadline of June 1st.
Okay, I see another question. When do we receive the health insurance? So if you are not waived, um, if you do not already have health insurance, you, need, you will need to prove that you do have health insurance. Um, and you can do so by purchasing the university's health insurance plan. I do not have the link handy um, with me, but uh, thank you, Laurel. Um, if you check the chat box, um, a link has been provided to learn about um, the health insurance option that's provided by the university. And that would, of course, be an additional charge on your student bill if you did need to purchase um, the university's health insurance plan. Again, if you have your own health insurance, then you will be receiving a communication from the university about how to waive, um, waive the university's health insurance. So make sure you keep an eye out for that and you'll wanna make sure you meet those deadlines so that the university is not charging you for their health insurance plan if you already have your own. Okay, as far as I understand, there was orientation for international students in the past. Is there one this year? Yes, there will be an um, orientation for international students that's planned by the university's, um, I believe it's their international students and scholars office. So you'll want to keep an um, eye out for communications. I'm sure that you'll be hearing from um, our Director for Recruitment and Admissions, Dr. Laurel Root, who will also be, uh, who communicates very closely with all of our incoming international students about requirements for international students. So there will, there will be a couple of sessions that are, that you must participate in um, with the International um, Students and Scholars Office, um, but you'll also be required to participate in the School of Law mandatory orientation. If there are any conflicts, we will make sure that we communicate um, what you should be prioritizing in advance. Um, and again, Laurel is really good with communicating to our incoming international students of where they need to be and when they need to be there. Um, so just make sure you're constantly checking your email this summer. Okay, another question. What resources or further assistance is there for first year classes outside of class in addition to the Jumpstart program? a great question. So we have a lot of different resources in place at the law school. Um, we have a director for academic success named um, Bill McDonald, who actually teaches um, in the first year curriculum. Um, but outside of his um, legal profession class, which everyone must take as a 1L, he is a resource for students who might have concerns or might be struggling with academics. Every first year law student also assigned an academic advisor who is a law faculty member and that will happen during orientation. Um, so we strongly encourage students to utilize their academic advisor. Um, we also have a assistant, or I'm sorry, a vice dean for student affairs named Bernadette Gargano, who's another great resource. Um, she is more of a resource for any non-academic issues that students might be running into that could impede their ability to do well in class. Um, I believe our student life office is launching a new peer-to-peer -peer mentor program. So you should keep an eye out for information about that. And then we also have a fully staffed career services office who's um, a great resource if for, for anything career related. And they begin meeting with first year students during orientation, and then it is their goal to meet with every first year student in the very first semester. Um, so we have a lot of resources in place. We also have our own in-house registrar that you heard me talking about our registrar's office. If you have questions about your course schedule, um, you know, questions beyond something that you might be struggling with academically. Um, but for academics, I would definitely use the resource of our of our student, um, our director for academic success, Bill McDonald, and then also your academic advisor. Um, will merit scholarships be adjusted if we are awarded other grants or scholarships? So the answer to this 99 out of 100 times is no. I guess the only exception to that is if you are awarded a grant that covers your entire tuition because our scholarships are 
um, our merit scholarships must go towards your tuition. So they cannot be, you know, they cannot go towards the fees or towards um, living expenses or non-tuition costs. Um, so they won't be adjusted. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, you rece received a $5,000 merit scholarship and then you also receive a $20,000 annual grant. I don't know from who, but let's just say that happened, which would be a really great situation to be in. Um, our tuition is for in-state residents. It's currently $25,410. So we would not need to adjust your merit scholarship because you would not exceed the amount of tuition um, in grants or scholarship, if that makes sense. If your scholarship is $10,000 and then you receive a grant in in the amount of $20,000 per year, then we would need to adjust your scholarship because we can only, um, you can only receive scholarship and grants up through the cost of tuition. I hope that was clear. If not, send me an email or we can schedule a phone call and I can try to clarify. Okay. Our next question is, I will be living on campus and I understand on-campus housing will be available in the end of August, which means after the mandatory orientation. Are there any places I can stay on campus during the week of orientation? Yes, in fact, the School of Law communicates with um, campus living um, about our mandatory orientation and we annually, we get an exception to the move-in date. So at some point over the summer, and this was not on the timeline, but it's something I can certainly add to the timeline in the future. At some point over the summer, we will reach out to our students who have um, uh, signed up for or been placed in on-campus housing. And we will ask them if they need to move in a week early. It, campus living will typically allow them to move in the day before orientation. So it would be Sunday, August 21st. Um, they would make an exception. And if you're a law student, you will actually be able to move in on that day. Um, so you'll wanna keep an eye out for the email communication over the summer. You will not need to find a place to stay that week. We'll make sure that you can get into your, your place of residence on campus. Do we need to provide proof of New York residency prior to enrolling so that in-state tuition is applied? Um, so if if when you applied for admission, you identified yourself as a New York State resident, um, we have a whole section on our application for admission about residency. And the way that you answered those questions have already determined your residency. Um, so if you answered that you are, live in the state of Washington and that you have never lived in New York State, then you have already been categorized as an out-of-state resident. If you answered that you are an, a permanent resident of New York State and that you have lived in New York State for longer than one year, you have already been categorized as an in-state student. If you answered questions that are vague, <laughs> New York is your permanent state of residence, but you've been living here for less than one year, then you've pro probably been categorized as an out-of-state student. If you think that you fall in that category um, and that by August you will have lived in New York State, for at least 12 months, then I would recommend emailing. Um, you can email me directly or calling our admissions office so that we can make sure you're categorized appropriately and that you're charged the correct tuition rate. Okay, moving on. I will be commuting from Rochester. Are there any resources to connect with students who are carpooling in the Rochester area to UB? So we do not have any formal resource set up for this. However, I have I know that I've heard from someone else who plans to commute from Rochester. I would recommend posting in our class of 2025 Facebook group. And then you will probably find others and we'll, you'll be able to connect um, outside of Facebook. Um, hopefully, you know, connect by email or phone or text. Um, and try to arrange a carpool. We don't have anything formal. We can certainly try to set something up. Um, so if you don't hear from anyone on Facebook, um, reach out and we can try to put the feelers out to see if anyone else is in the same position so that you can try to carpool and save on gas, which we know is expensive right now. 
do we provide housing for Jumpstart? So this we do not. Um, however, Campus Living does have um, transitional summer housing options that you can look into. Um, so if you are interested in Jumpstart and you want to take advantage of it, but you're coming here from out of the Western New York area, um, you can look into Campus Living's transitional housing options. If you are unsuccessful in finding that information online, again, just reach out to our office and we'll help link you um, to those resources. Are we supposed to establish residency in New York for our second year if we're non-resident? There's no requirement. Um, however, if you are able to establish New York State residency, you will save about four to five thousand dollars for your second and third year on tuition. So it is wise of you to do that. I will preface that with the fact that you need to establish residency in New York State for 12 full months in order to be eligible for in-state tuition. Um, Laurel already shared the link to the New York State residency um, requirements. So you might wanna look through those because there are other requirements that you must fulfill. The university and SUNY as a whole is pretty strict and um, with, with those requirements. So you wanna make sure you read through all the fine print, but it would be smart um, of you to try to establish in-state residency just because you'll, you'll save money on your tuition um, for year two and year three. Oh, thank you, Laurel. Also shared the Facebook group link. If you haven't already joined, you can visit that link to join um, and start to connect with classmates. Okay, do we have any additional questions? We still have about, oh, here's one. Great question. I am currently an undergrad at UB. Will my email and UBIT name remain the same? Yes, it absolutely should. Um, yes, the answer is yes. If for some reason it, it, you think that um, there's been a change, let us know, but it should stay the same. Um, Yes, that's the long and short of that. No problem. Okay, I'm gonna give it one more minute to see if anyone else has questions. Um, you can also, I'm going to just put our office phone number in the chat because you will likely think of questions after we wrap up today. Um, and you might want to give us a call. So that's the Office of Admissions. Um, someone from the admissions team will answer. Everyone on our staff is, is prepared to answer all these questions. So please don't hesitate and don't be shy. Um, we're happy to answer your questions. Does our scholarship amount change across the years? Does it depend on our residency status? So no, your scholarship amounts do not change. Um, if, if you are a non-resident and then you gain in-state residency, your scholarship will not be reduced accordingly. It, it stays the same. Um, so the answer is no. Also, once, um, once our students are enrolled, you're, you're, if you were awarded a merit scholarship, that scholarship um, also does not, it, it doesn't change regardless of your residency. Um, we often field questions, you know, if I do really well in my first year, could my scholarship be increased for years two and years three? Um, unfortunately, no. However, the School of Law, we do have a lot of donor funded scholarship opportunities that you can apply for once you are matriculated into the School of Law. Um, so, I do recommend reviewing our scholarship policy and the link to that was just shared in the chat as well. Um, but no, you know, if your residency changes, it's, it's not gonna have any type of impact on your merit scholarship. Um, just make sure you're reading the policy. You do need to maintain successful academic progress. Um, so you do need to be in good standing in, in the program to, to keep your scholarship for years two and years three. We have a question from a three plus three student. 
do you need another transcript in July? You won't have your BA yet. So that's a great question. Uh, we don't need a degree noted transcript, but we will need to see your um, spring 2022 grades. So we will need an updated transcript from anyone enrolling through our three plus three programs. Um, once your spring 2022 grades are posted, then you will want to send us that transcript. When is the first semester tuition due in the fall? That is a great question. It's typically due um, at some point in September. I'm not sure if those dates are out yet, but I will say your tuition deposit, um, I'm sorry, your tuition deadline to pay your tuition is, the deadline is, is um, linked to the date that you were registered for courses, which is part of the reason why our registrar waits until after a certain date to enroll first year students, um, because then we're typically giving our incoming law students the later deadline. Oh, thank you. So the link was shared in the chat and you can see it, it will depend on when you're registered for courses. If you're registered early, then it's possible your tuition will be due um, by late or by mid to late August. Again, I don't have the link up. So if you visit the link, you should be able to see those dates. Um, if you're registered for courses a little bit later, then you'll actually have a, a few more weeks before your um, tuition is due. And we do try to wait so that we are giving our law students time to get their um, loans in order if they do need to, um, if they are relying on student loans to pay for part or all of their tuition. Okay, great. Yeah, so August 24th is the earlier date. If you're registered a bit later, then you'll actually have until October 12th. Thank you, Laurel. Okay. These were some really great questions. Um, I'm just checking to see if we have any hands up or any additional questions in the chat. We do not. Here's one more for the visit. Are any of the costs covered, the travel or to stay overnight if we're coming from further away? So you can reach out to us individually if you're traveling from several hours away or from out of state and we can see if there's any funding to either um, cover the cost of travel or an, an overnight accommodation while you're here. We don't have a formal program in place, but um, it's always possible for us to look at the budget to see if that's feasible. So I would reach out to, and I'll put an e our email address in the chat. It's law-admissions, let me edit that, at buffalo.edu. Um, or you can give us a call at our general office line, which I shared earlier in the chat box, and we can see, oh, I'm sorry, I sent that directly to Jess. Um, we can always see if there's any funding available for visit. Okay, well, again, I wanna thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, I encourage you to join us for um, more of our virtual events this week and schedule an in-person visit if you haven't done so already. And once more, I wanna say congratulations we hope that Buffalo is at the top of your list and that you are planning to pay that tuition deposit by next Friday the 15th. But you know, if you still have questions and you're uncertain, please reach out. Again, we can't say how available we are and how ready we are to answer your questions. Um, thank you so much. Have a great evening and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.